In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first, because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness, because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. HD 189377b well, I'm not gonna say that again is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty, blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well, for comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf, whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium Located roughly 50 light-years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. Despite Dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Astronomers know for sure that the universe is growing bigger, and the speed at which it's ballooning is increasing all the time. But if the whole thing is swelling into something bigger, then it must have some kind of an edge, right? It's unlikely that people will ever find out. But if so, then what would it be? A ginormous brick wall and then nothing? An abyss that leads to nowhere? The most common theory is that the universe is shaped in such a way that it can't have an edge. But it's not the only idea. Another theory is even more difficult to comprehend. The universe is indeed infinite. And our part of it isn't that unique. It means that somewhere out there, there's another you. Or rather, other you. One of them is just a bit shorter, another wears their hair in different ways, and a third one is identical to you in all possible ways. Hey, good looking! Oh yeah, there's also a theory about a multi-universe that consists of many smaller universes. And the universe we live in is just a tiny bubble among other similar bubbles. Those scientists who support this idea are also sure that bubble universes can come into contact with one another. Then gravity starts to flow between them, and when two or three universes connect, a big bang occurs, just like the one that created our home universe. Everything on Earth and everything people have managed to see in space with the help of telescopes and other instruments is normal matter. 
It's made up of atoms and molecules, and adds up to less than 5% of the universe. Almost three-quarters of the universe is dark energy. Astronomers wouldn't even know the thing existed if several decades ago they hadn't found out that the expansion of the universe wasn't slowing down. Quite the opposite, it was accelerating. It meant there had to be some enigmatic force that counteracted gravity. It got dubbed dark energy. Some scientists believe that our planet used to have an additional satellite. According to their research, a smaller celestial body, about 750 miles wide, orbited the Earth just like a second moon. It most likely crashed into our main satellite later on. Such a collision could explain why the two sides of the moon look so different from each other, one being heavily cratered and rough. Scientists also don't rule out the probability that one day Earth will get another satellite. Even today, there are tons of celestial bodies that follow the planet. They're mostly temporary companions, though. But scientists say that the gravitational field of our planet occasionally captures even quite big asteroids that spin around the Earth for several months, or about three rotations. After that, they move on in their journey across the expanses of the cosmos. Kinda like hitchhikers. Now, earthquakes, or rather, moonquakes on the moon aren't something from science fiction. They actually happen. They don't occur as often as those on Earth, but they are much deeper and closer to the center of our satellite, about halfway between the surface and the core. Scientists believe this phenomenon has something to do with the gravitational force between the Earth and the moon. So, we can truthfully say to the moon, hey, your quake is not our fault. Get it? Fault? Alright, let's move on. About 20 million tons of gold can be found inside our very own planet and in the seas. If all this precious metal could be extracted, it would be enough to cover the entire surface of the planet in a two-foot layer of gold. And if we gave everyone an equal piece, each one of Earth's inhabitants would get 9 pounds of this treasure. But don't rush out to dig up your backyard just yet. The metal is extremely diluted. You can only get a gram of gold for every 100 million tons of seawater. But can we at least try? Please? It takes the light from the Sun just 6 minutes to reach Venus. This planet has the most circular orbit of all the planets in the solar system. Paradoxically, one day on Venus is longer than one year. See for yourself. It takes the planet 243 Earth days to make a full turn on its axis. At the same time, Venus makes one revolution around the Sun in 224 Earth days. Venus has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. Astronomers have already discovered up to 1,600 on the surface, but there might be others too small for people to see. Most of these volcanoes aren't active anymore, but there are some that could still be bubbling. The tallest mountain on Venus is Maxwell Montes. With a height of 29,000 feet, it's almost as tall as Mount Everest. Winds on Venus can reach incredible speeds. In the middle cloud layer of the atmosphere, they can accelerate up to 450 miles per hour. And that's faster than the swiftest tornado on our planet. There are no seasons on Venus, and one of the reasons is the tilt of its axis, which is less than 3 degrees. For comparison, Earth's axial tilt is about 23 degrees. That's why the hemisphere that's pointed toward the Sun gets more energy than the one that faces away. Venus's slow rotation causes its magnetic field to be way weaker than that of Earth. The hot planet rotates in the opposite direction of the Sun, and most other planets in the solar system. This phenomenon is known as retrograde rotation. The most probable reason for it could be a powerful collision with a huge space body, for example, an asteroid. If you visited Venus, you probably wouldn't be able to see the Earth or the Sun because of the super-dense clouds that always cover the sky of the planet. Despite scorching temperatures and mega-dense atmosphere, Venus is often called Earth's twin. <laughs> More like Earth's evil twin. You see, both planets are approximately the same size. What's more, the composition of Venus is like that of our planet. And finally, the orbit of our neighbor is the closest to Earth's. Venus is one of the very few planets we can see crossing in front of the Sun. Unfortunately, it happens very rarely. 
In fact, since people invented the telescope, they've managed to see the transit of Venus no more than 7 or 8 times. Venus is the brightest planet in the sky, and is the second brightest celestial object after the Moon. We've reached our home planet, the densest in the solar system. At the Earth's center, there's a core that takes up 15% of the planet's volume. It consists of two parts, the outer and the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles, give or take, which makes 20% of the entire Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's radius. The 1,500-mile thick outer core is liquid. It also consists of iron and nickel, but it's not under enough pressure to be solid. The temperature at the boundary of our planet's inner and outer core is 10,800 degrees. That's as hot as the surface of the Sun. And the pressure there is 3 and a third million times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. The mantle surrounds the outer core. This layer is about 1,800 miles thick and makes nearly 84% of the entire Earth's volume. It consists of silicate rocks rich in iron and magnesium. The crust is a relatively thin layer that takes up only 1% of the Earth's volume. Hey, I like thin crust! Along with the upper part of the mantle, it's broken into tectonic plates. They move as fast as your fingernails grow and let heat escape from the Earth's interior. The crust is mostly made up of oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, and other minerals. But it's time we leave our planet behind and move to the red planet. It's the last of the inner planets, which are also called terrestrial since they're made up of rock and minerals. Mars has a core made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. It's between 900 and 1200 miles across. The core doesn't move. That's why Mars lacks a planet-wide magnetic field. The weak magnetic field it has is just 0.01% of the Earth's. The mantle surrounding the core is composed of thick silicates, oxygen, and some other minerals. You can probably compare it with soft, rocky toothpaste. Yeah, brush your teeth with that. The Mars mantle is also much thinner than the Earth's. It's just 800 to 1100 miles thick. The planet's thin crust consists of volcanic basalt rock. Astronomers believe it isn't broken into tectonic plates and remains in one piece. The crust is covered with fine reddish dust that looks like talcum powder. I like my crust covered with tomato sauce and cheese. The next planet on our way is very different from the ones we've already visited. The largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, is a gas giant. If the planet was 80 times as massive as it is now, it would have a chance to turn into a tiny red dwarf star. Anyway, if you decided to parachute into Jupiter, you would never land on a firm surface. It's still unclear whether the planet's core is a molten ball of liquid or a solid rock 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. There's even some evidence the gas giant's core might be melting right at this moment. Whatever the truth is, the temperatures at the center of Jupiter reach 63,000 degrees, give or take. Around 90% of the planet's atmosphere is hydrogen. The remaining 10% is made up of helium with tiny traces of other gases. Under immense atmospheric pressure, hydrogen and helium gases turn into a dense fluid the deeper you go. Closer to the core, this liquid becomes the mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. There's no solid ground on the planet. That's why astronomers define the planet's surface as the point where the atmospheric pressure equals that on Earth. You wouldn't be able to stand on that surface, though. It's just another layer of gases. But the gravitational pull there is more than two and a half times more powerful than that on our planet. A neutron star gets born after a supernova collapses. After birth, it rotates extremely fast, about 60 times per second. But this rate can sometimes grow up to 600 times per second. Makes me dizzy. Space isn't supposed to be black. There are stars everywhere. Shouldn't they light everything up around? You don't see stars wherever you look because some of them haven't existed long enough for their light to reach Earth. Another one of Saturn's moons, Iapetus, has a unique two-tone coloring. The difference between the satellite's two hemispheres is impressive. One of them is light, and the other is eerily dark. Scientists haven't figured out this mystery yet. 
all of the planets of the solar system would fit between Earth and the Moon with some space left. Yes, there's lots of space in space. Saturn isn't the only planet that has rings. Gas giants Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter have rings of their own, but they are thin and almost impossible to see. NASA can convert plasma waves, radio waves, and magnetic fields into audio tracks and listen to what's happening in space. They record all kinds of intriguing sounds, from beeps to ambulance-like howls. At the same time, space itself is an eerily silent place. There are some sound waves and vibrations, but people can't perceive them. Chariklo is a tiny celestial body orbiting the Sun between Saturn and Uranus in the outer solar system. Just 157 miles across, it's not a planet, but it has two rings of its own. And that's not one of them.